Hi. Uh, so welcome to this video about research questions in the ongoing series related to my book, The Effect, uh, which is now available uh, for free online at theeffectbook.net. You can also find links to purchase it there. Uh, so in this video, what we're going to be talking about is research questions, right? The whole point of doing research is that you want to be able to answer some sort of question that you are interested in. If you don't have any questions about the world, then what is it that you are exactly researching in the first place? Uh, so we want to make sure that we have a research question that it actually makes sense to do, right? Uh, so how do we do that? How can we make sure that we come up with a research question that makes a lot of sense? Now, uh, in this video and in the book, we are talking specifically about quantitative empirical research. So there's plenty of research questions that might be great for your English paper or whatever. We're not going to talk about those here. Uh, we're talking about what are we going to do to come up with a good research question and how do we know if we have a good research question uh, when it comes to empirical quantitative research. So what can we do? So first of all, we need to think about uh, what are we doing here? Right? What are we trying to accomplish? And usually what happens is that we have some sort of theory that we're interested about. We are interested in how the world works in some way. And we want to answer a question about how the world works. We want to know, you know, what's going on under the hood of the world. Uh, we have some idea about how things fit together, and we want to see if that is correct. So we have to have some sort of theory. Now, the theory here can be a very gen general idea. It's a very broad idea of a theory. It just means that there's some, some sort of why or because or explanation going on uh, that tells us what we're talking about. Uh, so uh, for example, let's say that we have a theory about exposure to different cultures. We think that being exposed to a lot of different cultures makes you smart, right? Uh, so what, what, how is that a theory? What is the why going on there? Well, we might say that, well, one reason why some people are smarter uh, than others is because some people have been exposed to more different cultures, and that would make them smarter. Maybe that's the theory that we have in our head. That's one reason we think that we see variation in intelligence, that one small part of that is going to be exposure to different cultures. Okay, so that's our theory. Why that's we that's one way we think the world fits together. So from that, we need to think, well, okay, what what can we make of that? Because that's a theory, that's an idea about how the world works in general. But we can't just check that because we don't necessarily know. Even if we look at data about intelligence and exposure to different cultures and all that sort of stuff, it doesn't actually tell us what the answer to our question is, whether or not that actually explains why that's going on. Data is not very good at telling us why. It's very good at telling us what. So the trick is, how can we get from the why to the what and then back again? Because that's the real goal of a research question. It's that we have a, a question about why, but all we can see is what. So we want to figure out for the why that we have, what what can we answer? And then how can we go from that what back to the why? Right? We want to actually be able to inform our understanding about the world to get a better sense of how things fit together using the data that we have. Right? How can we do that? So. Uh, the thing that we want to make sure that we're doing first, and this is the hardest part, is to make sure that we come up with a research question, a question about what we will see in the world that will answer our why question. Because there are lots of different what questions we can answer. We can look at data and just see what it says in many, many different ways. And the question is, what does it actually mean? Right. So we have this idea about why we think uh, people might be more intelligent or less intelligent, one reason being that you know, some people might be exposed to more cultures and other people might not. Okay, great. So we look in the data and we see that, yeah, it looks like uh, there are people on average who are more intelligent also tend to be more exposed to more cultures. But you can already see the problem there, right? That, well, we see that in the data. We see that those two things go together. Um, but uh, how can we actually claim that that answers our why question? Because it could just be that people who are more intelligent in the first place choose to go become more exposed to different cultures. Uh, and so, and you can imagine a couple of different alternative research questions that would answer that. Well, maybe instead of just looking in the data to see if those two things are related to each other, we run an experiment where we expose some people to different kinds of cultures and we see if later on they become more intelligent. And you can see how that version of the research question, where we're again looking in data at the relationship between these two variables, but among a subset of people who we've randomized to be exposed to different cultures or not, that does answer our why question of interest, whereas the, just looking in the data does not. Right. So the question is, how can we go from the why question that we have to pick a what that we can see in the world that will actually inform the why question that we have? So that's the goal. What are some things that we can do 
to uh, come up with good questions and make sure that we actually have a good question that makes sense, that we don't fall into the trap of thinking that we have a research question that's going to answer our why question, uh, but then getting to the end and realizing that, no, actually, we haven't done that yet. So a couple tips. Uh, so one, uh, a really good good thing to get into the habit of is considering the potential results. Before you do any sort of data analysis whatsoever, imagine what you would do if you happened to get different results in different ways. Okay, so let's go back to our culture and intelligence question. So let's imagine that we are going to run this analysis just looking at the relationship between exposure to cultures and being intelligent. And let's just say that we happened to find that they're positively related. Would that inform our why question? Well, we're going to say, oh, yeah, great. I, you know, I thought that was what I was going to find. That's exactly what I found. Sounds like I'm good to go. Except, well, what, would, what if you found the opposite? What if you found that actually people who are more intelligent are exposed to fewer cultures? Well, you say, well, uh, you know, maybe that's just something else going on. Uh, you know, uh, maybe it's just, uh, you know, they're, they're too smart to bother spending time getting exposed to different cultures or I've measured cultures weird. You'd start making excuses, right? Uh, because you had this idea about how the world works. You found something contradictory. If that's what happens, if you if uh, finding something that doesn't correspond to what you expected doesn't make you change your belief about how the world works, then probably finding something in favor of what you expected shouldn't either. Right. So considering the different possible outcomes that you could get and asking yourself if that would actually change your understanding of how the world works. Uh, if you don't get that, if you find a way to start making excuses, uh, if you get one set of results or another, that probably isn't a research question that actually answers your thing, right? Because there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect between what you actually see and what, how you want to understand it. And what you want is for there to be a very clean answer to your why question based on what you see in the data. So in your experiment version, you randomly assign people to uh, either see more cultures or fewer, and then you follow up on them later. And it turns out that the ones that you randomly assigned to see more cultures were less intelligent afterwards. Well, you know, that's hard, a little bit harder to argue with. It, it sort of shows, shoots down your idea about how you think the world works. It sort of shoots down your theory, which is exactly what we want, right? We want it to be the case that the data that we see actually makes us think and change our understanding about how the world works. If it doesn't do that, there's not much point in running the analysis in the first place. And it probably suggests that you picked a research question that doesn't actually address your theory. Second, uh, just some more on the practical side of things. Uh, you want to think about feasibility. Can you actually answer the research question, right? It's not too difficult to get some data on intelligence, some, some sort of IQ score or something like that, uh, you know, and maybe try to get some measurement on how much they, people have been exposed to different cultures. That's possible, right? Um, but in, for a lot of research questions you might come up with, the data simply might not exist. So, for example, if we decide that the research question we want to go with is the experimental version of what we just talked about, can you actually run that experiment? Will anybody allow you to randomly expose people to more cultures than other people not? In that case, that might be okay. Maybe you find some school kids and you give some of them a global studies course or something like that randomly. Maybe that's okay. But if you want to answer a question like, hey, I want to randomly assign the minimum wage across different states, well, nobody's going to let you do that, right? That's not, a, that's not a feasible way of answering that question. You would need to find a different research question that also answers your theory of interest. Uh, on this line, you know, you want to think about scale. Do you actually have the funds to be able to implement your research question, your funds or time or whatever it is, uh, you know, or do you not have the money to run that experiment or collect all the data that's necessary, right? Uh, maybe there's a research question that you can answer by getting every single uh, home transaction, but that would cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars and way, uh, dozens of people's time over a year to actually crunch all that data and work with it. And maybe that's not feasible. Another thing that you need to consider is design. Uh, is it actually possible to find a setting in which you can do uh, the answer to your research question in which hopefully will then answer your theory, right? If it's not an experiment, or if it is an experiment, is there a setting where you can apply that experiment? Great, we already talked about that. Uh, but if it's not an experiment, if you have some sort of observational data that you also think that you can analyze to get at your research design, does that setting exist? Maybe you need to find a setting in the wild where some students have been randomly assigned to a global studies course and some people have not. Does that exist? Can you find that? Can you actually implement the design that you would need? You would think, hey, I know how to answer the quest this question without running an experiment. Great, I just need to find a place where this thing happens. Does that thing happen anywhere? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, so that's something to consider too. Finally, when you're thinking about good research questions, keep it simple. It's very easy, especially when you're starting out, to try to answer the, try to explain the entire world with your one research study. 
Uh, why are some countries rich and other countries poor, right? What is the best form of government, right? These are all big, massive questions that we would love to know the answer to. Uh, and yet there's no way that you're going to be able to answer it uh, with one question, right? Or with one research question, uh, with, with one study, it's impossible, right? You, this is the kind of thing that takes a long, long time. And you're, if you do try, you're going to end up with probably a pretty bad result. Uh, one of the most common ways I see this is people want to know, what are the determinants of this thing? I want to know what are the determinants of school dropout? And then they run, a, they make a paper that has like 30 different determinants of school dropout. And then you can't really do anything with the results because it's just all a big a mush. Right? You haven't actually answered any one question particularly well. You just sort of have a mush of, of results. So if you've got a big question like that, carve up a little chunk of it. Maybe do that one little chunk first. Maybe just ask, hey, uh, does having a free school lunch help you stay in school? Right. That's a small research question that is well defined. You'll know when you found the answer to it. You can probably find an actual research question that will help address the theory that you're interested in, as opposed to just having a big old ball of stuff. So that's the down low on research questions. A uh, good way of thinking. You want to think beforehand, before you get too deep into it, whether the thing that you are doing in the world, the thing that you are observing, A, will actually answer the research question that you have, and B, whether the research question that you have will actually answer the theory that you have. Uh, and so that's what you want to do before you get too deep into it and you realize that you're not doing anything worthwhile. All right, thank you.